just ask questions anytime. It doesn't make any difference at this point. All right, so we're going to talk about moving content into Drupal using the Migrate module. And this is a different approach from, you know, if you had a regular, another Drupal site and upgrading, using the upgrade path to move your content in there. And just before I start off, um, you know, I'm going to talk about a Migrate a little bit. The, um, just talk a little bit about how migrations should work uh, under ideal circumstances um, and how Migrate handles this, uh, this stuff. Uh, we'll go through some code on the implementation, and if there's any time, we can go through some of the commands or demo. And um, I think we can probably make this a more of a Q&A uh, at this point. And before starting off, I also want to thank uh, the people that actually wrote out the Migrate module, which are Mike Ryan and Mo Schweitzman. Uh, Frank Carey, who wrote out the Migrate Extras module, which is uh, around the contributed modules in Drupal. Um, for all the stuff, and Andrew Morton for doing an initial presentation in DrupalCon Denver. Uh, and I used some of his slides through my presentation, so, you know, I want to make sure that he's attributed properly. Actually, did I start? Let me just check. Okay, it is recording. Good. So, you know, if we were talking about migrating content, there really are a few about three or four different options that you have for bringing content in. The first is you can do it by hand, which means you, you know, have someone manually copying the content over. It can be accurate, but it is very time consuming, and unless you have someone that you really dislike, that you can pass this kind of task over into, I don't suggest it. And this is the only joke that I have through the whole presentation, so, you know, I'm not going to be able to say much more than that. Um, you can write some custom scripts, and I've done that for a few sites. Uh, this is prior to feeds or the migrate module. And it works as a one-off solution, but mainly because it's as flexible as you want it to be. And you can also write out Drush plugins or web UI, whatever you want. But you have to write all of that stuff out. And you also have to worry about how you're going to be tracking the content that you've brought over. Or if something messes up, how do you roll back to be able to bring that content over again? And, you know, just trying to figure out what, how it's integrating into it or trying to get someone else up to date with what your code base really means can be kind of weird. Um, if you're scared of code and it's a relatively simpler migration, you can look at using the feeds module. It's an absolutely great alternative. It's relatively easier to set up. Um, Tommy's in the room, and he knows feeds pretty well, and if you have questions regarding it, I ask him <laughs> about it. Um, it maps fields from the source to the destination, so it gives a UI for, able, for being able to do that. Uh, you can import RSS feeds, Atom, various kinds. You can also import from CSV. Uh, you, it even has a plugin to be able to import from a database. So if you provide where the database source is, you can provide a mapping into it. And it also does LDAP feeds. I actually needed that for a project just a couple of weeks ago um, to import all of the users that we had in our LDAP directory into our Drupal site. And the feeds module was able to, like someone wrote out a plugin that did just that, and it worked excellently. Um, it's well documented, but there are some performance issues with it. Like it can be a little bit on the slower side. It also, at least in my experience, it's not handled content updates as well, though I think Tommy might be able to help me with that if I asked him. And if you are migrating various types of content that have references in between them, it gets a little bit iffy in that aspect as well. So when you're starting to get into something that's more complex that you know, you're having relationships between various pieces of content, um, that's when you can start looking at something like the Migrate module. You can even do it for simpler stuff, but for complex things, this is where it really shines. Um, it's object-oriented to move all your content in, but there are many def defined sources that you can import from, and this includes XML, JSON, CSV, the database. You could even import a file directory if you wanted to. It has such an option. Um, from the core migrate module, it imports into all of the core entities that are in Drupal core. 
So users, nodes, comments, taxonomy, all of that stuff is there. And with the migrate extras module, I believe you can import anything that's supported from the entity API. So since more and more modules are moving towards using that module anyways, it, it really is becoming, you can migrate into any kind of entity. It is fast, it's, it's very fast. Um, the downsides would be the UI is fairly basic, um, mainly because it's been steered around Drush for a really long time. They're looking to change that a bit more with the next major release of Migrate. There is Drush integration, which is positive, but you have to do things from the command line. And you have to write code. There's absolutely no way around it right now. Um, again, they're looking to change that for version 3, but... Didn't they have a UI previously, like the initial version of the past? Migrate 1 had a UI, and there were lots of issues surrounding um, people trying to migrate their content in. So then they completely rewrote version 2, stripped out the UI, stripped out the ability to do mappings from it, um, concentrate on, on making a more solid code base before attempting that whole side of the thing again. That will fix the user complaints. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the initial user interface only allowed you to see mappings. It didn't allow you to do any sort of content migration or any of that sort in. It's just been slowly getting introduced in over the past year. Um, so these are the three different screens that you would see in a migration. It's hard to read, but I mean, for this part, it's pretty inconsequential anyways. So the black and white is the command line, and these are just some of the commands that are at your disposal when you want to do a migration. This main screen here that my mouse is over is listing the various uh, migration classes that have been created, along with saying how much content is there from the from the source database or whatever your source file is, and along with how much you've imported into your site. And it also gives you some options to be able to do the migration right from that user interface. And third, the one that's kind of hidden is showing the various pieces that are involved in that migration class. Uh, and it's letting you know whether or not there are fields that you have mapped out, and along with, um, I can't remember what else, uh, what values you've set for those various fields. If you're using Drupal 6 to do a migration, you'll need two other my modules to go along with it. One is the autoload module, and the other is the dbtng module. And this is basically to um, bring it in line with the autoload classes that went into Drupal 7 along with the way the database layer works in Drupal 7. So whatever code you write for Drupal 6 pretty much works for Drupal 7 as well. Um, I'd mentioned already that Migrate Extras provides support for many of the contributed modules. Um, in the past, a lot of the field handler related uh, migration code has gone into the Migrate Extras module, but more and more of the um, of the fields projects like date and link and all of that, they're putting in the migration classes right within their modules. And aside from this presentation and for a blog which I'll self-promote, the best um, documentation really is in the beer.inc and wine.inc uh, files in the migrate module. Um, they're always up to date. Mike Ryan does a fantastic job uh, making sure that any code changes or any API changes, whatever it might be that happened, um, are updated there with any release. So um, if you can't find enough information in you know, other resources, you'll definitely find it in these two files. So let's get down into it. When you're migrating your site from something, you have some sort of source with you know, some kind of ID, you know, you have a various sets of fields that are part of it, and you want to bring it into, into Drupal, which has some sort of ID as well, along with some set of fields. And, you know, they might be named slightly differently, like one might have a username, the other one is coming into Drupal will be a user ID. So, when you're, um, when you're doing these mappings, that's something you have to keep in mind. And in the case of Migrate, it refers to this as a source. So that's the interface to your current set of data, be it a CSV file, JSON, whatever. Um, it's, it's from there, 
uh, where you're going to provide the list of fields that are available to be mapped into your Drupal website. And it's also responsible for iterating through each row of data that's there. And what I mean by that is each row of data that's coming in is going to map to a row of data that's going to go into Drupal. So if you have something that has multiple rows of data, like one, let's say if you have a blog post that has multiple image fields in it, you don't want them all to be separate rows because then Migrate's going to treat it as multiple entries of a blog data. You also have a destination. And in, in the case of Drupal, it might be something like a user or a node of a particular content type. It could even be a row in a particular table. Migrate has the ability to copy content specifically into a table that you have. So if you have some sort of custom module and you need to migrate content in, it'll let you do that. Um, and I mentioned each source record correlates to one destination record. And there are ways to be able to map around the multiple fee um, multiple values in a field issue, which I'll talk about as well. You'll have field mappings, and this links a source field to a destination field. So it's going to know about how this data relates to um, its Drupal equivalent. There, the migrate module provides some basic functions, such as splitting a particular value that you have. Like, let's say if you had multiple values in one, in one row, you can tell it to split off a certain delimiter, so then it'll automatically um, turn it into an array and make it a multiple field value for you. And you can also pass additional arguments into it. Um, some of the field handlers implement this stuff, though they've been getting away from that as well. And I'll explain that as we're going through this. So, you know, I've explained through parts of this. And as you're starting to look at your migration, you realize that well, certain things are different. You know, like, sure, I'm mapping my title and it's exactly the same. But like I would mentioned, the username is now changing into a user ID in your Drupal, inst in your, um, Drupal instance. Um, field 1 is really a combination of field 3 and 4 together. And, you know, field 1 is field 30 in your Drupal site. Like, just the way it's all being organized at this stage. So you have to figure out, then you start realizing that you need to start altering some of the data that you're bringing in as well. And as a part of it, there's a concept called mapping. And what this will do is it'll allow for connecting a source and destination ID that you have or create mimicking fields that are coming in from the source database without them actually existing. So you can create them as you're writing out your migration code to, to facilitate some of these alterations that you might be doing. Um, it's gonna, it tracks the key schema format that you have, and this is for the ID, and it allows for migrations to rerun, update any existing records that you have. So if you change anything in your source database, it's gonna know about that change and update it in Drupal accordingly. Um, it'll also allow for any imported records you it allows for records that you've imported to be deleted on your Drupal site and not worry about them in the future as well. And this mapping also allows you to reference the ID from one migration class in another migration class. So like I was talking about references. So let's say I have a festival and I have a bunch of events. I can import my festivals and then when I'm importing my events, I can tell it to find the festival ID from my festival migration and it'll, it'll know about it and it'll bring it over just fine. And this is just the map table. This is the thing that's kind of keeping track between the two, um, the source and the destination. The migration part of it is what's setting up all of these pieces together. So you're providing the source, the destination, that map, and the field mappings, so what data is relating to the Drupal equivalent. You provide, you might provide some logic for skipping over certain rows that you're bringing in. So let's say you're bringing over festivals, but one of them, let's say um, the library festival, is not supposed to come over. You can, you can do a check and see if this is a library festival, then don't import it into the site. 
You can also alter the source data during the migration. And you, it also gives you the ability to alter the entity that you're dealing with right before it gets saved during the migration process. Um, we can skip over this one. We'll get into that a bit later. The destination handler, uh, I'm just bringing it up. It's, it's just to add existing uh, functionality or sorry, it's to add functionality to existing destinations that are there. So like if you have nodes and they're supposed to have comments, um, this is one of the things that could have it. Or flags, that would be another way to do it using destination handlers. So now we can start getting into the implementation. And in this case, there are really two things that you're doing. One is you're going to write a hook to let Migrate know about your module. And secondly, you're going to build out a migration class. In that, and inside that, you're going to provide a description of what your migrate class is bringing in. And it can be anything. Um, you're going to give it information about where that content is coming from, which is the source. You're going to let it know about where the content is going to get saved, which is the destination. You're going to map the fields from the source into the destination, which is the map. And then optionally, you're going to massage the data, add any fields, whatever it is, um, to get the initial mapping. And finally, if you absolutely need it, you're going to alter that um, node or whatever type of entity it is right before the content gets saved. And finally, you need to register the class file and the info file. And then you're kind of ready to go. For hooks, there's really just one. Um, it's hook migrate API. And inside that, you're providing an array with um, what version of the API you're dealing with. Right now, it's on 2. In the future, it might be on 3. That's what uh, Mike Ryan's working on, or 4 or 5 if it's years down the line. And inside the class, or when you're creating the actual migration class, it consists of at least one function, and that's the constructor. You also have the prepare row, the prepare and the complete functions, which are, which are optional. And what happens in all of this is Migrate looks through the source and goes through it until it finds an, a record that it can bring in. And um, if you've implemented it, it'll call on, or sorry, it'll start applying the mappings and the field handlers that you have to convert the source row into your entity. It'll then call on prepare row to let you modify or reject any additional data that you have. So um, that also gets brought in. Um, it'll do a call to prepare. And if you've implemented that function, it'll allow you to modify that um, entity. At that point, the entity gets saved. And then it calls on the complete function. And in the complete function, you're basically going to be able to trigger out any calls to any other things you have within your Drupal system to let it know that uh, to let it know about this migration if it needs to so you know if I brought in my events and somehow for some reason if my festival needs to get updated that might be a place I would do it so inside the constructor that's where you set up the source the destination the map and the field mappings and, you know, in this, I've laid out a very simple version or version of what it would look like. So this source equals some set of code that you have related to, this, to that source, um, source thing. Uh, same with the destination, same with the map. And then when you're adding field mappings, you have this add field mapping with whatever my destination field is and uh, getting connected to the source field. So with the source fields, you're basic, as I mentioned before, you're basically letting it know about potential sets of fields that are not necessarily in, in that data. Like, let's say if you were dealing with a database that are, in the, uh, that are one of the database fields, but it's going to be necessary to bring in that whole implementation. So like in this case, I have, let's say if I have a table called... Um, MT, and I have a source ID, and they're called MTID. So I'm specifying that in here, and you know, just giving it, letting myself know that 
This is the source row ID. And there's another field, which is going to be my compound field, called compound field 1. And this is field not from the initial query, but, it'll, but I'll need it later on. And when you're providing your migration source, then in that case, you're going to have some sort of query around it, let's say, if it was from a database. So you just generate the query in the way that you do it in Drupal right now, which is using a DB select query. And in this case, I'm doing a DB select with my table with an alias of MT, bringing in a bunch of fields, joining it in with something else, and then I have this source equals new migrate source SQL along with that query. And I'm also passing in that source fields from the previous uh, page. So it knows about which ones are, um, which one's the source ID or whatever it might be. So if it was, if you're dealing with migrations from the same database, this is what the code would sort of look like. If you're dealing with something that's external, it looks very similar, but it is a little bit different. Um, first of all, you have to be able to provide it some sort of connection to that other database. Um, so that's what I have here. So connection equals database get connection for migration. And this is something that I've defined in my settings.php file. So like how you can define, you know, databases default default equals some stuff. You can have databases for migration default equals something. Or, you know, you can call it whatever you want and you just change it here accordingly. And then your query starts looking the same. So you have query equals connection select at that point instead of db select. And when you're doing the migrate source SQL in this way, the other part that you have to let it know is that map joinable equals false. And, and the reason for that is when migrate is dealing with a migration with a database, it'll typically try and join, um, when it's doing the mapping, join database one with Drupal database and try and see if it can do the mapping there directly. It's supposed to be a lot faster, but when you're dealing with a separate database, it might not be able to do that. So this lets Migrate know that there isn't an easy way to map the IDs. It performs a bit more computation, but it lets you do that kind of, it lets you work with something that's remote if you wanted to. Are there any questions so far? Yes. So just to reiterate what you just said about the external database, so you set up your the database in the settings.php, so you set up mm -hmm. the and then you, so then you can just call that in your database get connection yep. and migrate. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then because it's an external database, you just kind of prevent it from doing some extra work and trying to join it and do the map joinable as false. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> right, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful, but yeah, because it doesn't have an easy way to know that it can, it can do like, you know, select from database one, join with database two, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll start doing, it'll start processing stuff in the back end to keep track of that kind of material. So it's a bit more intensive, mm -hmm. but like I said, if you could have a database that's local, you could have another database that's, you know, halfway around the world, mm -hmm. and you can still do your migration. So you don't have to export your database, you know, no. as a file and just connect to it. Exactly. Um, when you're defining, if if this was a, sorry. Can you do that within the same database? Yes. Okay. So if you're within the current database, mm -hmm. let's say, you don't need to make a connection to some external source. Okay, so in that case you would not. Yeah, you can just use db select and go on with that and it'll be faster. Um, you can also define, like I mentioned, you can define CSV files. So, you know, you just create your, what the set of columns are in your CSV file, like letting it know field one is called CVA, CSV UID, field two is email, so on and so forth. And then you have this source equals new migrate source CSV, along with where to find the CSV file, um, what set of columns are there. And if you had a headers row, then you're letting it know that there's a header row as a part of it. Um, you can also import JSON, XML. I mentioned file directories as well. 
I haven't actually tried it with file directories directly, but the code, like the, the beer and wine examples imply that you can do it for sure. Um, but like with anything, like because you've seen how the changes are there between the different sources from, you know, uh, your current database to a remote database to a CSV file, uh, you can expect to make some changes depending on like a JSON or XML or whatever kind of thing. And you'll also define a migrations, migrate SQL map. And this is that thing that's trying to keep track of the IDs that are there in the source ID or, or in the source um, website with whatever's coming into Drupal. And this can actually be a compound field that you have. So like, let's say um, there are two, I, there is a, a pair of IDs that denote a single entry in whatever your source is, this will allow you to do that. So in this case, I have this map equals new migrate SQL map. And this machine name is just going to be the class name that you have. And I'm providing an array that lets it know that there's something called MTID, and that's the, um, that's the source ID that's in there, along with what type of value it is, if it's unsigned, not null, um, which alias table to it can expect to find it from as part of my um, selection query from before. And also let it know that it's going to be migrating against a node. Like I'm going to be bringing content into a node, so it knows that it's going to be dealing with an NID that is doing the mapping. Whereas if it was with a user, it would be dealing with a UID or taxonomy, TID, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to just talk about this part very briefly. It's, uh, it's called, Migrate has a concept called high water in it. And you may have noticed in my previous database queries, I actually had an order by in there on the updated field. And the reason for that is um, Migrate has the ability to figure out if a piece of content has been updated. So it'll update an existing piece of content that's in your system rather than remigrating it or deleting an old record or whatever it might be. So you just need to let Migrate know which column contains that high water data. So this high water field equals an array. So the name of that field is updated and it can expect to find it in the table that has an alias of empty. Yep, yeah, exactly. So if you point if you point that one to a base camp update where it can be in the field and it'll just check that field. Yeah, it'll check that field to see if it has changed and if it has then it expects oh it's an it update. It against what's in Drupal or it compares it against something else. It takes whatever's in that source field yeah. and it'll compare it. Typically you want it to be some sort of a date stamp or something yeah. like that. And it'll compare it with what Migrate has stored as part of its mapping for... So Migrate has its own whole mechanism of doing the comparing rather than... Exactly. The Drupal database? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we're using this to migrate publications and companies, you know, site to Drupal. Mm -hmm. And so they have to let their editors, you know, they're like, well, when, you know, when do we tell our editors to stop publishing stuff, you mm -hmm. know, when, when you migrate? We, you know, we're telling them, you know, you just need to let us know You're going to then just define what your destination is going to be. So, you know, if, it, if you're dealing with tags, let's say, then this destination equals new migrate destination term. And this is going to bring in, this is going to let it know that you're mapping it to taxonomy. And in this case, I have site vocabulary. And this is the bundle that I've created for my taxonomy. So it's going to know to specifically to import into the site vocabulary 
um, bundle that I have. Or if I had, if I was dealing with nodes and I had a content type called articles, then this is letting it know that import into um, the node entity with the articles bundle. And with users, migrate destination user. And if you're using the entity module and you were importing commerce stuff, let's say, then you'd have like migrate destination entity commerce product because each entity has a bundle of its own. Um, and then we get into field mappings. So you can have something that's simple. And in this case, let's say we had this add field mapping you know, and our field name was DEST name, and our source name was source name, then it knows, okay, whatever value is in the source name column from my, uh, from my source database is going to map into this particular, particular field exactly. Um, it can be a set value. So, you know, if I had a user ID and I wanted everything that's coming into the system to be user ID 1, then I could have add field mapping for UID and let it have a default value of 1 in that case. Um, you can also do add field mapping path and I have issue group DNM and what that's letting it know is that this is something that's not getting migrated um, from whatever's coming in. So just fill it in with whatever default value would provide for it anyways. Uh, you can also do multiple values with a separator so this add field mapping, field tags with source tags, and separate them into the multiple values for anything that has a comma in it. So like if I had an event and it had art, comma, school, comma, play, um, it'll, it'll separate them out into three tags this way. And you can also have arguments. So add field mapping for field body, um, from the description uh, in the source database along with these sets of arguments. And I've mentioned arguments a couple of times, but I also wanted to mention that at least with the newest release of Migrate, what they've actually tried to do is they've tried to move some of the settings that would previously be arguments as their own field mappings in in the migrate, if you look at the migrate UI or whatever it would be. So like, like in the case of a uh, text field with description um, that Drupal has, instead of looking into the arguments and seeing where all of these pieces fit in, they ha now have field body colon teaser. Or, you know, if you're dealing with a file, then it might be file field colon destination or things like that. So Again, this is a bit hard to read, but you can see that I have a text field called field source code, and then I have a meta mapping for it underneath it called field source code colon format. And I have this for each of the different text fields that I have, that I have in my system that I'd be migrating all this stuff in for. So you might be defining more lines of mapping in your code, but at least when someone else is looking at it, it makes a, a lot of sense on what they're looking at. Or like if I'm looking at this screen and if I could actually read what's here, you can see, oh, I've mapped out the text field, but I haven't provided any sort of format for it. Maybe I need to go back into my code and provide that. Um, the fields that are outside of the my core migrate module, such as date and link and all of that, they still need to get around to, to using this new format that they have but they'll still work with arguments. So that old system is still there. It's just a bit more work. And um, I provided the node ID that you can see what kind of weird stuff sometimes happens. So now we'll go back to the arguments again <laughs> at this point with um, at least for older code that's in stuff like link or whatever. So. Previously, this was used to pass the multiple source fields idea into a single destination field. So as an example, let's say I had a body field with a summary. You would have something like add field mapping body source body along with the arguments where summary is coming from the teaser column 
and I'm providing a format of one, whatever that might mean. And this is just going into more detail regarding it. And what it's letting you do is, like, let's say if I had multiple fields that are using the same set of arguments over and over, you could actually create a default argument for it. So, like, arguments equals, if I was dealing with files, migrate file field handler, um, provide some path, provide the kind of action it's going to do, like copying, um, whether or not it should rename the file, um, along with where it's going to get the source field for the image alt from. And then you'd have add field mapping along with arguments for that stuff. And when you're dealing with migrations from another class, um, it's relatively easy from this point. You'd have this add field mapping, UID, author ID, and source migration. And that's where you're naming the class that brought in the users, let's say, in this case. So all you need to do is, once you have done this kind of source migration, you can actually add a dependency on your migration class towards the other one. Um, so in this case, this dependency equals an array with my user migration. And what will happen is before this particular migration runs, it'll make sure that everything from my user migration has been migrated in before bringing the content over. Are there any questions around it? It's, it's relatively straightforward. So now that we have gotten out of the constructor, we get into any set of additional processing that you might require. So like, you know, if you need to, if you have something with multiple fields that couldn't be brought in initially, like let's say file fields, you can't necessarily get them in one single database query and kind of try and separate them with commas or whatever it might be. You might need to insert or modify some of that, uh, some of those data mappings that are there. So you have three uh, functions that you can implement that, or two functions that help with this. The first is preparo, and the other is prepare. And they're useful in different ways. So with preparo, it'll actually pass in the row from whatever, whatever the source data is coming in from as an object, so you can ma start making modifications to it. Um, and this is where you can also indicate that a row should be skipped during import by returning false. So, like I'd mentioned, you know, if you see, if row title equals library festival, return false, and it'll make sure that the library festival source does not get imported into your site. And in this case, I have row field three is equal to row field four plus row field five. So that's how I'm putting together content if I need to. Or if I had um, an access field that was in some, some really weird date format, I could turn it into a timestamp. And same with my images, like I can start making an array out of that data so it can be brought in correctly. Uh, in the prepare function, you're going to be, uh, it's going to be passing in the entity object that's being built out just before it gets saved. So all of that stuff that happened in the constructor and in the prepare portion, it starts building out the entire entity object. With prepare, it gives you that, along with the source row that all of this stuff was coming from, and it starts letting you modify the entity that you have with you, so that, you know, just before it gets saved. And this is useful in the event that you're dealing with something that does not have a field handler. So let's say, in this case, I provide link as, a mod, as an example. Uh, the reason I provided that is because uh, the dev version of link has the migrate field in there, but the stable version does not. And let's say you're using the stable version, uh, but you need to be able to bring that stuff in. You could implement the prepare function, and you could have something like entity field link along with, you know, uh, the way the field gets structured equals whatever set of values you need for all that data. And you could also bring in, like, let's say menus or whatever uh, other stuff that you needed to as a part of it. And then finally, after all of that, after the entity gets saved, the, the other function you can implement is the complete function. 
And as I mentioned, this is a chance to update anything else that's in your system that references that particular mm -hmm. record. Uh, just don't use it to save the same entity that just got saved again. It's mm -hmm. not a good idea. Okay. Migrate can also deal with circular dependencies. So let's say I have events that reference other events. And, I mean, that does sometimes happen, right? Migrate has a concept called stubs. And I provided the ID for it, uh, or sorry, the link for it that goes into it in more detail. But the gist of it is you specify what the source migration is on the ID's field mapping, and you'll create another function called create stub. And what will happen in, in this scenario is as it's creating whatever the current entity is, it'll see, it'll, um, let me remember this correctly again. It'll see what the reference ID is. It'll check if it exists. If it does, then it'll, it'll just map that in. If it doesn't, it'll use the create stub function to create a dummy version of that particular entity in your system. And then once that particular thing that's migrated, well, it's already been linked together at that stage. So, that's how it keeps any sort of circular dependencies that you have working. So yeah, you have to run it once, so it creates the stub operation, and then you can run it a second time just to make sure that it all gets fleshed out. Can you link those two together? Just run it back to back in one operation? I mean, if you do it from the command line, you can just run it twice if you wanted to. There's also, a cons there's also a thing called dynamic migrations in, uh, in the migrate module. And the idea behind this is, um, well, these are two different things. This should have said destination migration. I'm sorry. So the idea with this is sometimes, you know, you have migration modules that are out there right now, like commerce migrate or, sorry, Commerce Migrate, Ubercart, and WordPress Migrate, they'll bring in a good chunk of the content from whatever the other site is, but not necessarily all of it. So I ran into this with a Ubercart website where the person wanted it to get converted into a, a commerce website, but the client had created a whole bunch of fields around the product content type, and none of those got migrated over. So you can extend this, I, what you can do is you can actually extend a migration by creating what's called a destination migration. And it's pretty much the same thing as all of the other migration stuff that's there, but in your constructor, you'll provide the type of record that you're migrating in, along with where to find that uh, ID value. So there's a variable called system of record, and typically, it's set to migration colon colon source. So it knows that there's some other source structure out there that it can get all of this data from. Uh, but by setting it to destination, you're basically letting it know, I'm going to be updating a record that's already in the system, as opposed to migrating a new piece of content in. And then the other part that you have to provide it is uh, the field mapping for that particular entity ID. So if I was dealing with nodes, I'm letting it know, look at the NID um, column. And I'm also letting it know that the source migration was node bundle migration in this case. Or if I was dealing with a commerce product, it might be commerce product migration. And yeah, that's, so in this destination thing, you can provide any other additional sets of fields that were supposed to have been brought in, run that migration, and it'll, it'll, uh, it'll expand what you have. And this was just something I had regarding suggestions for implementation. And this is just something that I run into as I've been doing migrations. Um, firstly, with my, the new release of Migrate 2.4, there's the ability to migrate your files separately from the rest of the stuff that's, uh, that's in your system. And with this, you can retain the structure of your file source directory that's there. So in our case, we have a photo archive, 
which has 150 to 200,000 odd images. And they've been organized by our photographer like very meticulously. He's very anal about it. When we wanted to do a migration, he really didn't want to move out of that structure because just because of the way it's organized, he didn't want it to start getting changed up if we decide to move out of that system or if he wanted to copy it over onto his own directory, uh, onto his own computer afterwards. So you can actually create a file migration, bring all of those files into, into Drupal, and it can keep that structure that you had in the first place. And then you can have a secondary migration, let's say four photos, and just reference that particular file migration that you brought in, and it's going to keep the file IDs, all of that stuff, intact. And um, now you have your photos, you have your files, they're in the directories they're supposed to be, and you're done. You have to have two separate migrations, it's a bit more code, but you're getting the result that you want in that case. And that's really about it. Um, if you're thinking about doing stuff for Migrate as a contributed module, like let's say if you wanted to flesh out some of the stuff regarding file handlings or you're dealing with, I don't know, an LDAP migration and you didn't want to use feeds for some reason, you can write a destination handler for it. Um, if you're working with some other type of entity, let's say media or some weird thing that someone comes out with, well hopefully um, you can try and convince that person to use the Entity API module for the Entity needs and then extend on using the Migrate Destination Entity class. And if you're creating new types of fields, just write a field handler for it so, so that Migrate knows about it and someone can use it as opposed to going through the whole prepare route and you know, trying to figure out the structure of how that field should be. And these are some references that I have that you can look at. Um, Migrate is obviously the main uh, source of code. Migrate Extras is all of that contributed stuff that I talked about. Uh, Mike Ryan has started doing work on a Drupal to Drupal migration, a generic one. So you can upgrade, so instead of going down the upgrade path and trying to do an upgrade from Drupal 5 to Drupal 7, let's say, or let's say when Drupal 8 comes out, Drupal 5 to Drupal 8 for some unknown horrible reason, then um, you could try and see the kind of work that Microin is doing in this project. It, it's very interesting. And I've linked to two sandboxes that I have for migration stuff as well. One was for migrating a site from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, and the other was for creating a field handler for migrating stuff from the references module into the relation module. And this is some more documentation that you can look at. Um, like I mentioned, aside from the beer.ink and wine.ink files, they're really well done, but sometimes they can be a bit much. Yeah. They're, they're, um, they're so complex and comprehensive. Right. Um, there's some documentation at this particular node on drupal.org. You can also look at the presentation that was done by, um, by Druish at the DrupalCon Denver. And I've written out because I found some of that documentation overwhelming myself and I needed to just keep track of how I was doing some of this stuff, um, I started writing about it on my blog and I've linked to that here as well. And let's see. That migrate. Oh, just start running it. So this is a migration that, let's see, so this is a series of migrations that I have on my site. Uh, one of them, like I mentioned, it's for doing files. One was for bringing in, uh, and one was for bringing in pages. So inside my files, oh boy, let's see, I think I might have messed something. Okay, I can't really do a demo at this point. Or, let's see, courses. The only real demo I can do is one that I built off a CSV file, unfortunately. And that site might be a bit slow. But in the meanwhile, are there any questions? You had your hand up. I was just wondering, the beginning you said you know, like you can revert back with the migration doesn't go as well. 
Yep. That's what, you know what, I can demo that. I can definitely demo that one. Let's see. Assuming it logs in fully, all right. So in this case, I have a migration that involves uh, courses and policies that we have on our website. So in my, in my policies, I realize, oh crap, um, it didn't go as I expected. And you know, it didn't bring in some stuff or some errors were thrown, all of that stuff. I can go in, I select my operation, I can hit rollback at this point. And what it'll do is all of the stuff that was imported in from that particular migration will get deleted from your, um, from your site. So let it go through that process. And then after that, you can go in, clean up the code, whatever you need to do. Uh, and then you can start testing it out again. And I'll show one other piece that can be done from this. How yes? proof is that rollback? Is it like a true undo button? Yes. It, it does a very good job. Um, alternately, instead of trying to uh, import everything in at once, you can, you know, you can select your migration, you can go into the options area, and you can say, I just want to import five items, let's say. So you can just kind of test it out and see that it's working correctly. Uh, there we go. So now it's created five, it's brought in five of the policies that I have. I see there aren't any errors. Um, if I go into my content area, let's see, type equals catalog policy. There we go. We have five different policies that were brought in as a part of it. So this and, is a great tool for testing your field mappings as you're going along. Yeah. Right? You can also do this from the Drush command line. Oh. And that's, uh, the, doing it through Drush is much more robust. You can actually have it show you status messages like, you know, show how many you've imported every 30 seconds or every thousand items or whatever it might be. Um, version 2 of Drush was really designed to be able to bring in millions upon millions of pieces of content that are on your site. And, I mean, I don't have a site with millions upon millions of pieces of content, but when um, we had one site that was in Drupal 6 that I mentioned, we recreated the site in Drupal 7, like just using all of the stuff that was happening in Drupal 7 at that time. And then, you know, we imported some of the content in as, this, as they were working on it. They were able to continue updating the site as they had at that point, like up until launch day. And then we changed the code base to Drupal 7. We ran a final migration to update and insert any new content that might have been there, and it was live. So. Literally, it took 30 seconds to get, you know, to launch a new version of the site for us. And that's it. So the, um, the demonstration you gave where you just did five items, can you then go and say, okay, update the rest of it? Yep. So, so I can go in here, execute the import, and it'll update and bring in the remainder of the stuff. The Pardon? It won't do anything with the original file. It'll just leave them. Yeah, it'll just leave them. And actually, let me see if I can, because I had a policy, that's what I was importing in, and I didn't realize that that was using a database, so let's see. All right. I think that should work. Okay. So on this site, I have some sets of policies. Okay, it's brought all the content over. I can get to it quickly. All right. So, you know, I go in and I change a particular policy. And let's say I removed and changed it to test. So now this has been updated. I can go in here. It won't show, necessarily show up here, but if I click on uh, executing the import again, it'll now show that once being updated. Okay. And if I go back to the content, 
uh, there we go, faculty and student relationships now shows test. So that update went successfully. Okay, so it doesn't really matter if you do testing on the field. Yes, exactly. And cool. that's it. If there are any questions, we can talk about it outside and all that stuff and let you get on with it. Good job. Thanks.